First of all, I'd like to pay my respects to Dodie Anderson, who passed last week. Uh, there's a one and only Dodie. Uh, she was an amazing person, so positive, so upbeat. Uh, she certainly was very gracious and generous um, you know, to the University of South Carolina, to the state of South Carolina. She made a difference here. She made a difference for so many student athletes. She was a great friend of Carol and I's since we've been here in Columbia, and, and, uh, and she's going to be missed. She was a great Gamecock. She loved the Gamecocks. She loved Girl Scouts. Um, uh, but she will be missed. I'm going to talk to our team about a way to honor her this fall uh, for, for so much of what she did uh, for us here at the University of South Carolina. Uh, back in June when our guys were Hold on just a second, Coach. They yeah. said they're not getting audio. Is that the case? Looking to see. Somebody give me a thumbs up if you're getting audio. I'm seeing thumbs up. So, All right. Um, back to you, Coach. All right, we're going to go ahead and where we were. Roll on. Okay. We started back in June. Uh, I talked to our team about the, the mature, responsible teams are, are going to be the, the successful teams. And, and I've been really proud of how our guys have handled the situation. You go back to spring semester, uh, we ended with a 3-6-1-4 cumulative GPA. Three out of four of the last fall and spring semesters, we've had a cumulative over a 3-0 GPA uh, as a football team. I think we've handled the summer well. Uh, you look in right now in the in, for throughout the state it's, uh, month of July in the state of South Carolina, um, as far as the COVID positive test, it's between 14 and 16 percent um, in our state, and it's less than five percent in our building. And two of the positives we had in July were guys that had been out of town and, and had come back in for a test. And so, uh, really proud of of how they're handling uh, a very difficult situation. Uh, I'm encouraging them to lead a very boring life right now. Boring is good, uh, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's hard sometimes, especially for young people, uh, to lead a very boring life, but that's what we need to do as we continue through the summer as we start into fall. Uh, I told my team actions are louder than words. A lot of people have questioned student athletes being on campus. Uh, my son's at University of Georgia playing football because I think that's the safest place for him to be right now, uh, going to school there. Uh, and being in that building with a school that's got the very same protocols that we have in place. I told him at one point, I'm not a doctor, your mom's not a doctor, and your brother's not a doctor, but they've got great medical care there, just like we do here at the University of South Carolina. And there's no question uh, that that's the safest place for you to be. And the numbers speak for themselves. So uh, I hopefully we'll continue to trend downward in those numbers uh, as a state and as a, uh, a football program. I do want to compliment Clint Haggard and George Wynn uh, for what they've done during this time and researching what other people are doing and giving the medical advice from Prisma and different places that we are able to access. Uh, they've just done a fantastic job for us and being uh, putting the protocols in place to, for the, the, the paramount uh, is the, the safety of our student athletes. And, and they, they have done a, a fantastic job for us. Uh, our league made a decision uh, last week to play 10 conference games only. Um, in order to start our season later, which was by the medical advice uh, to start the season later. Obviously, we're monitoring the pro leagues, the NBA, the WNBA, uh, the National Football League, and Major League Baseball to see what they're going through right now, what we can learn from that. I think that was a great decision by Commissioner Sankey. Uh, as far as that's concerned, to be able to have uniform testing, to be more flexible, uh, you know, schedule-wise to be able to move games around if we have to. And unfortunately, uh, we're all disappointed that we're not going to be able to play Clemson. And that's the bottom line. I expressed that to Coach Tanner and to President Caslin how important that game is to our both institutions, to our state, to our region, and to college football. And we are extremely disappointed in the decision. But we only have one vote of the 14 member institutions. We voted to, to, to have a plus one situation, and we didn't win the vote. And that's just the way things had, had fallen. Uh, but I know that uh, President Caslin and, and uh, Coach Tanner both expressed uh, their feelings uh, to our league that we, we wanted to play the game. So we're extremely disappointed uh, that that will not you know, happen this year. Uh, Injury-wise for our team, Rosendo Lewis tore a tendon in his quad. He'll be back mid-September. Uh, yeah, it happened during spring ball. It's a very unusual injury. You know, Chad Terrell is still coming off the ACL, I would say, mid-September mid again. Jaheim Bell had a meniscus from high school. I think he'll be cleared 1st of October. Uh, Eric Shaw had some bone spurs. He'll probably be back in, in two weeks. And Ernest Jones had his appendix removed. Uh, came to practice or walkthroughs last week and 
said he had a, a some some sharp pain in his stomach and uh we we went took him over to the hospital and they said he had appendicitis and they, they removed it it was not an emergency deal or anything he's fine it was kind of a relief that it was an appendix i uh i've never had a mike linebacker miss workout for a tummy ache uh so it was very fortunate that uh I talked to his mom, Portia, that he, he had the appendix there. Uh, and he'll be back in you know, a couple weeks here. Two players have decided to opt out on our football team. Mark Fox and Jordan Rhodes will certainly respect their decision and understand that. And that's certainly their, their, their right at this time. As far as our team is concerned, you know, we came back with some in-person meetings on July 13th. Uh, they, they increased the care hours to eight, where we were able to have strength and conditioning for six hours and two hours of meeting uh, per week. And uh, I thought we did a nice job of some in-person meeting, which is the first time we've been on Zoom for so long. And then July 24th, we were able to, to start walk through with the ball, which I think was a, a great decision you know, for all of us to get back on the field, especially installing a new offense. I would say probably on both sides of the ball that through these walkthrough situations, we've been able to go through about 80 to 85 percent on offense and on defense of what we do. And uh, we'll have another week to be able to, to, to continue to look at some things before we start training camp on August 17th. As far as our team's concerned, Mike's very pleased with the quarterback position with Ryan and Colin and Jay Yurick and Luke Doty. Luke is still a quarterback, uh, but all four guys have done some really good things and, and, uh, and uh, really excited about you know, th that, that room. I know Mike is as well. Luke also is a guy that's going to play some different things for us. At the end of the day, you know, when we finished our first day, five days of spring, and I do this every year, I have the offensive coaches treat this like a draft. And I said, after the first five practices of the guys that participated in those five practices, draft your team, uh, one through 11. So who are the best 11 guys uh, on our offense? Do the same thing on defense, and then we cross side the ball. The defense does the offense. The offense does the defense. So draft your team. And Luke Doty's name kept showing up in those top 11. So he's sub four five. He competes his butt off. He practices hard every single day. He's extremely bright. He's extremely intelligent. Uh, and he can contribute to our football team and help us win football games. Bottom line, he's a really good athlete. So uh, he's a guy that's going to play multiple spots for us offensively. Uh, you know, receiver excited about Shy going into his senior year. He's had a really good summer. Uh, looking forward to, you know, seeing him to continue to progress. Xavier Leggett, I think, has made some, some huge strides from his freshman year. Uh, it's really the light starting to go off for him. The carry on Joiner's done some really nice things. And as a young guy, Rico Powers uh, is going to play for us this year. The guy's got – he can finish on the top end, uh, but uh, a guy that we've been really pleased with. We need some other guys at that position to pick it up, and it starts with practice. You know, being able to get out there and, and practice and practice the right way. But, you know, those five right there I know can contribute and we can win with it. Running back, Deshaun and Kevin – Marshawn, Rashad Amos has done some really nice things. The Quandre's on campus, but since he was out of state, he has to be quarantined, tested and quarantined for seven days uh, based on the CDC protocol. Adam Prentice will give us some different looks as far as some two-back things are concerned, so uh, he's progressing well. You know, up front offensively, we kind of left spring. You know, Jazz and turn time would probably be our left tackle. We moved Hutch back inside to guard. Eric Douglas and Hank Manos continue to battle at the center position. Vinny Murphy obviously can figure in there. Uh, Javon Gwynn at right guard and Dylan Warnham at, at right tackle. Um, and I feel like, you know, we, we've moved Ja'Kai and Jalen that both played tackle for us last year can play inside. you got to have some flexibility and create depth within, you know, the best available player on the field. And, and those guys certainly will be a part of that, you know, conversation. Vershawn Lee's a young player that's been very impressive uh, so far, but at tight end, you know, Nick Muse has come off the knee really well. Will Registers looked good. You know, Chandler Ter uh, Farrell, you know, Keyshawn Tony. We need the young guys to keep keep coming on. And Eric Shaw and Jaheim Bell both were playing tight end for us. Unfortunately, I have not been able to participate so far. Defensively, the guys up front have done a nice job. I'm, again, I'm, and, I, and I would echo offensively and defensively. Really excited about this freshman class. I mean, you look at Alex Huntley and Micaiah Scott up front. Two guys that have been very impressive, big bodies and moving around, extremely bright, uh, learning things very well. Tonka Hemingway at defensive end, you know, he's up to 270, looks great, moving around. Uh, you know, the Sam and Buck position, you got Gilbert Edmond and Jordan Birch, both freshmen that have been very pleased and impressed with what they're doing. Uh, as far as those things are concerned, Mo, Mo Cobb at the linebacker position. Uh, and then the defensive backs we've been very pleased with as well. So, uh, you know, we feel pretty good about where we are at this time, considering. 
uh, you know, f trying to find out who the next two opponents will be. I hope we'll find that out today or tomorrow and, uh, and, and seeing where we play and when we play teams and uh, looking forward to, to playing some football and getting back to some normalcy in our lives. And I'll open it up for any questions. David Kleininger with the first question from Post and Courier. David. Hey, Will. Thanks for doing this. Um, you mentioned how uh, you've had very good results with the quarantine protocols in place. The regular students will come back to school in a couple of weeks, and there will be some in-person classes. Just how difficult will it be to try to keep those safety protocols in and the bubble in place uh, when they are going to those in-person classes? Well, that's, that's a great question. We had actually – I had our senior leadership group meet with Coach Tanner and Chance Miller, I believe it was Monday night and, uh, or Monday afternoon, to talk – you know about some of those questions that maybe I can't answer from an administrative standpoint. I know uh, I know Coach Tanner meets with President Caslin every day. Uh, they've shown some models as far as the classroom is concerned of the social distancing. Uh, obviously, wearing a mask is extremely important. Washing your hands is extremely important. And then what you're kind of bringing up is you know, your exposure to the unknown. And, and I think that right now I would guess that there's probably at least 10,000 students on our campus right now. Uh, that are on our campus. If you drive through Five Points at 930, uh, there's a lot of people out. So um, they're not social distancing either. Uh, but that's like I told our guys, you got to make smart, mature, responsible decisions, lead a boring life. Uh, that's fine right now. That's what we need right now. And um, a lot of our classes will still be online as far as that's concerned. Uh, so, so you still will be doing uh, your, your learning from from. Uh, remote places and, and, and such. So uh, it is a concern, but that's something that uh, we got to continue to work through. Next question is Ben Briner from the state. Ben. Hey, well, uh, thanks for doing this. Uh, what kind of a challenge has it been? You mentioned there were a, a few positive tests. What kind of a challenge has it been with uh, certain uh, groups of, of roommates having to get sh shut down and sort of playing, I guess, mix and match through some of these walkthroughs? Well, I think that, you know, again, we've, we've done some things against each other. And uh, it goes back to, number one, if you wear a mask, regardless of your less than six feet with 15 consecutive minutes is what they call contact tracing. Uh, but if you're wearing a mask, that isn't in effect. So that's why it's very important to wear a mask. And, and, and we're on the field in the walkthroughs. We're in the weight room uh, emphasizing to our guys and our staff, you have to have your mask on. Uh, but we, Clint Hager does a great job of if, if there happens to be a positive to go back and, uh, and research what contact tracing occurred with that student athlete to make sure that we're making the best decisions and what's safe for our student athletes. And, you know, whether you got symptoms, uh, don't feel good, you got you to let us know and we'll test you immediately. And that's, that's, that's number one for the health and safety of that particular student athlete, but it's also for the rest of the building. Next question goes to Gene Sapikoff. Gene. Will, yeah, thanks for doing this. Um, is it okay with you if your players speak out publicly to the media or on social media about any virus safety concerns they might have? Well, we've given our guys plenty of opportunity just within our organization to speak up. We also have a, uh, a hotline for all student athletes here at the University of South Carolina to call and express any uh, – you know, if they're uncomfortable about our protocol or, or what we're doing, uh, I think about every day I have some form of talk with our team. If you're not comfortable with something, you need to let me know immediately. Uh, so th those communications are, are, are open uh, within our organization and certainly within our athletic department. What about with outside your athletic department and organization? For instance, if an NBA head coach said, take it from us, these players want to play, would you believe that coach or would you I'd believe that coach, and I'd believe the players. Next question goes to Colin Taylor. Hey, well, thank you for doing this. I guess you kind of talked about the students coming back on campus. Are there going to be any added protocols from the football side of things outside of what USC is mandating, or you kind of let USC kind of take the lead on that? Well, all students that come back to our campus and are taking classes have to have, to have a, a negative test. You know? So I, I do know that. Uh, and then I think from that standpoint, any, anybody, and we've told our players, whether it's on our football team or it's in your dorm or it's in your apartment complex, if you notice somebody with symptoms, then you need to notify people so we can get that person tested to make sure that they're, 
clean or, or they're, if they're positive, then we need to make sure we, we create some distance from that. So, uh, again, we've encouraged our, our guys in, in all situations to – we also have a hotline within our team that, that, that a, if an underclassman sees an upperclassman doing something, maybe he doesn't want to say anything, you call that hotline. And it lets George Wynn know. George Wynn comes to me and we handle it. I think all of those things are important within our family right now. Josh Kendall with the next question. Josh. Well, do you know? Yeah, what uh, you got. We want to do this like our players. You got to put your picture up there. I'm, I don't know that I look my freshest and best today. Hang on, let me see if I can figure that out. All right. Hello. So, um, do you know what percentage of your kit guys will be taking online classes, and how that might differ from we're, what you would have done last year? We're still working through that. I think that Katie Christensen had told me she had about eighty-five percent of the roster done, uh, and we haven't had that discussion yet. And do you know yet? contact tracing will look like once you start practicing have those rules been communicated to you we have we've got to be able to have a face covering whether it's through the a face mask whether it's a gator that i have here whether it's a, some form of a mask you know, as long as you have that on the field then you you should be fine so your guys will practice with some sort of face covering yes okay thank you let's go to phil cornblue Uh, hey, Will, and uh, good to see everybody once again. What's your take on what the players have demanded out in the Pac-12 and now in the Big Ten? Do you sense that that could happen at the SEC? Um, do you agree with what the players are asking for in those two leagues? Uh, sure, it could happen. I, I, I've not seen the Big Ten, but I did look at the Pac-12 this weekend. I would probably say 85% of what – they are asking for we're doing in our program and we're doing within the southeastern conference uh some of the other demands are not on my level that's on an administrative level as far as revenue and those things are concerned so i'll let ray tanner an answer those let's go to eric boynton thanks for your time today coach yep. just want to get your thoughts on them uh, on the sec mandating uh, the start of full-time practice being pushed back a couple of weeks, would you have been more in favor of just kind of getting things rolling right now, or you think it's good to wait a couple of more weeks to just have it limited? Well, as far as the season's concerned, based on the calls I was on is with the medical experts was we needed to push things back, uh, whether it was going to be September 19th or September 26th, uh, which they settled on the 26th, which we've got now 12 weeks to get 10 games in. Um, but that was from the medical experts as far as they, they, they wanted to push it back as far as possible, obviously, to be able to monitor. Uh, and I think that's the safest thing for our student athletes, which, you know, you still have 40 days to get 25 practices, which you have two days off, one is, that's completely off unless you're getting some form of treatment on your body, and then one day where you just have two, two hours of meeting. Uh, so we don't, we'll never practice more than three days in a, uh, more than three days in a row. I think it's good. I think spreading camp out is going to be help our players as far as health is concerned, as far as football is concerned, uh, to stay more fresh because camp does get uh, a little uh, tedious at times. Uh, so I think it's good for our players. I think that, you know, it will not be a true camp setting. We start school on August 20th. We report on the 17th. We've got two days. Uh, where our guys will be involved in the in being in the building. Other than that, that we'll have our normal seven to eleven block in the morning, uh, and then and then they'll be you know going to class. Secondly, have you had anybody, any players, come to you personally and discuss possibly opting out or what their concerns were, and if so, kind of what was what was their uh, line of thinking? No, it was just uh, Mark and, and uh, Jordan. But other than that, uh, you know, I've had a lot of one on one conversations with our guys uh, since. I would probably date back to April uh, as far as, uh, you know, guys that have concerns. We've met with m multiple medical Zoom calls with our team, uh, an expert epidemiologist, uh, to answer questions for our guys. And our guy, I learned a lot. Our guys have got some great questions about can you get it again? I mean, all, asking all the different questions of how the, the, the virus is transmitted. Uh, so, uh, again, I think that uh, – there are a lot of questions out there, uh, and, that, and I think our guys have done a really good job of, of asking the right kind of questions to, to make them feel more comfortable in the situation. Thanks again. Next question goes to Pete Acabelli. Uh, hey, Will. How are
how are you? I uh, hope you and your family are doing okay through all this. You too, Pete. Um, you talked about your guys and how proud you are for how they've handled protocols and things like that. How they handled all the changes that are out there when they think they're going to start to practice, when they actually are going to start to practice, is their enthusiasm for the game still right where you want it to be? Absolutely. I, I don't think there's any question. I, obviously, I think the biggest issue, Pete, that we've dealt with or that I've been dealing with since the, probably the last three weeks is all of the uncertainty. The uncertainty of the season, the uncertainty of a start time, the uncertainty of training camp. Uh, that was that was the biggest issue I was dealing with with our football team was every day, and I don't blame them. And I, it kind of got got to me at times. It got to our staff at times of when are we going to start? You know what's going to happen? What is this going to look like? And there's still a lot of uncertainties. You know that's part of it, but. Um, you know, I think that that has settled our guys down a little bit. I was able to stand in front of our team today and put up a calendar of training camp. This is what this looks like. Hopefully today we'll get our next two opponents. We'll find out where, when and where we're playing them uh, as we continue to move forward. So I think that, you know, the more definites that you can put in front of a young person right now, the better off you're going to be. And, and that certainly was a daunting task is dealing with all the uncertainty. And that was probably – not even as much questions about the virus as there were about the uncertainties of the season and what we're doing. And certainly I, I, saw, I saw an excited football team today about training camp. Let's go to Rick Henry, WIS. Hey, well, good to see you again. Hey, Rick. And thanks for doing this. Yes, sir. You mentioned the pro leagues earlier. When you look at what, they, what they're doing as they get restarted, what are some of the things you've seen that gives you hope and maybe extra confidence that – Football, college football will be able to pull this off successfully. Well, again, we're in an unprecedented time. There's no handbook for this thing. And, and uh, I'm going to borrow from Commissioner Sankey, who borrowed from uh, General Colin Powell, who's one of the great leaders of our country. You know, there, there's, there's what we know, which right now there's, we're going through, we're all learning right now about this virus and about what we're dealing with. There's what we don't know, which unfortunately probably a little bit more than, than you feel comfortable with. Uh, you know, there's what we think, which it doesn't really matter what I think or anybody else on this call because we're not doctors. And, and I've got a bunch of experts out there, especially some wonderful parents that want to tell me what they think. And I'm like, well, you're not a doctor, so I don't really know what your opinion matters. And then that's what we hope. Well, if you sit around hoping for everything, you, as my father told me a long time ago, you're going to have a pile of hope in one hand and a pile of crap in the other. So, you know, we're, we're, we're all working – to get as much information we can from the experts of what we got to do for the safety of our student athletes. Uh, is there risk? There's risk for all of us, staff, coaches. I'm not coaching from the balcony. I'm on the field with our players. And, and there's risk for everybody. But as I said before, there's no question in my mind, this is the safest place for our players. No different than me sending my son to, to, college, to uh, Georgia to play college football. I think that's the safest place for him to be at this time, being doing what he's doing. So, um, you know, again, I think we're all going through this. I think that there's a lot of conversation, obviously, from league to league, uh, from the NFL to so we all can beat this thing together. And I think that's what we're trying to do. Let's go to Mike Uva. Mike. Happy birthday, Mike. Appreciate it, Coach. Uh, you're, you're a day before me, so I guess I'm going to have to owe you a drink or something. I don't yeah. know. But, uh, Coach, uh, obviously, like you said, there's no blueprint in terms of how to handle this, but in terms of preparation, you know, how is that kind of different in, in being able to prepare for a training camp? Because obviously there's just going to be so many different challenges that you guys have, have never faced before. Well, you know, to me, it's still 25 practices in 40 days. It's spread out a little bit more. We still have an acc acclimatization period of two helmets, two shells, full pads. Uh, again, I, I think that um, different guys uh, – you know, you got to make sure the conditioning of your team right now. There may have been some guys that have missed some time because of different reasons. And so you've got to be, you know, smart about your football team right now and see, know where they are from a conditioning standpoint. Paul Jackson and his staff have done a fantastic job with our guys this summer. Uh, and, and I think you got to be really smart about that. But it's still 25 practices, and, and that's about what we've normally done anyways. Uh, it is spread out a little bit more, which, again, I think that benefits a student athlete. I think that helps the guys being able to recover uh, better. So I think moving forward, that ought to be a model that we ought to look at. I even love the, the, the walkthroughs we were able to do were very beneficial for our guys as well. We're further along, even though installing a new offense, than we probably would have been 
uh, where, where we normally are because of being able to have those days and do those days. John Whittle has the next question. John. Hey, Will, th thanks again for doing this. Sure. Uh, if, you, if you could uh, tell us what Colin Hill is kind of able to do right now and, and what have you learned about him over the course of the summer? Well, he's, been, he's cleared for everything, John. Uh, you know, he's really a talented thrower, which we knew that uh, when I took the job here at South Carolina, we tried to get on Colin and Mike already had him locked up to go to Colorado State. Uh, we tried to get in that one late in the game, but uh, a very talented thrower, obviously understands uh, and Mike puts a lot on the quarterback uh, offensively and has a great understanding of what we're doing offensively, but a very talented thrower. What's that? Do you, do you feel like he has a chance to be the starter? Sure. Yeah. We got a great competition going on. That's what you know, Mike and I were talking this morning. That you know, competition makes us all better, makes us all sharper. We know we got to bring our A game every day to practice, which that promotes consistency and performance. So it's been good for everybody. Ryan's thrown the ball well as, as well. And, and, and last thing with, with him uh, coming along so well and performing so well, does that give you more comfort in, in letting Luke play some wide receiver? Well, sure. I mean, that's, you know, at the end of the day, there's going to be one quarterback on the field at a time. Um, but it goes back to me as much as anything, that comfort level, there's no question that helps. Uh, but the other part of that is he's one of our best 11. Uh, and, and the guy's a great competitor. The guy brings tremendous speed to our team uh, and, and catches the ball extremely well. So we need to get the guy on the field. Thank you. Go back to David Kloniger. Yeah, well, um, just looking at Israel Makuamu, obviously a lot of uh, preseason accolades, some postseason accolades from last year. Are you guys looking at him to stay at corner, maybe look at him at safety some? Well, he reps at safety. Israel's very smart. He can learn anything. He can play nickel. He can play dime. He can play safety. He can play corner. So, again, it all goes back to if we're in regular, let's get the best four DBs out there. Who those four may be right now, I couldn't tell you. Then when we're in nickel, when we're in dime, let's get the best five or six DBs on the field. You know, Cam Smith and John Dixon have made a lot of strides. Those guys have had a good summer. Uh, I think both guys are in really good condition, and I've been very pleased uh, with them moving around and watching those guys move around. We need to get better, and we need to have more production at the safety position. There's no question about that. Ben Briner, his next question. Ben. Uh, hey, Coach, I, I wanted to ask kind of two questions. First, what was the conversation like with Luke when you kind of – broached uh, playing him some at wide receiver and also what was the conversation like with those two guys who op opted out? How did they kind of approach it? Well, first of all, Mark and Jordan, I totally respect and understand their decision and th those conversations will stay between me and them. Uh, and Luke wants to play. Uh, we call, Coach Bobo talked to him a little bit. I called him after Coach Bobo had talked to him and uh, said, I don't want you to feel we're moving you. We're not moving you. We're trying to get you on the field. And he said, Coach, I want to play and I want to win. So an another selfless guy. Uh, on our football team. Let's go to Colin Taylor with the next question. Yeah, well, I'm going to ask about Jordan and Mark real quick. Just, what's the plan for them this year? Do you just say don't report to the field, or how does that process go? And mm -hmm. with two teams coming on your schedule from the West, how does it impact your scouting? Because I know you guys do a lot of pre-scouting in the yeah. summer before. How does that kind of affect um, well, as far as Mark and Jordan, they, they stay on scholarship, and then and then we've had, since we don't have primary care for them every day, uh, they, they 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 both have returned home to stay with their families. Um, you know, hopefully we'll find these out tonight. I think they, I don't know if they're trying to make us burn the midnight oil here and, and and get some breakdowns, but we do a full scouting report and game plan on all twelve opponents. So we've got East Carolina, Coastal, Clemson, and uh, Wofford all game planned, and and uh, they're going to sit on the shelf. Uh, obviously this fall. So uh, we'll add those two opponents once we get – we've all – obviously uh, uh, Joe Lyle's got all the SEC film, so we might have to access if it's a new coach or new coordinator uh, to go where they were before. Uh, but we'll game plan those guys before August 17th when we start training camp in all three phases. Josh Kendall with the next question. Well, this touches on Mark and Jordan a little bit too, but if the doctors that you've communicated with told you that linemen could potentially be more at risk, and do you think that that played into their decision? I, well, I haven't been told that, and that was not a conversation we had. Next question goes to P. Dacabelli. Well, you obviously 
obviously uh, lose one of the one of your defensive stalwarts in uh, Javon Kinlaw. Who do you see kind of stepping up to fill the role that he he did this season? Well, I think you've got a combination of guys that I'm I'm personally excited about. Kier Thomas is a guy that only played in two ball games last year because of the ankle. Uh, Jabari Ellis has made tremendous strides. You know, I, I think about Jabari day one to where he is right now. At the end of the season, he was a very productive football player for us. Uh, Rick Sandy is going into his third year. Uh, needs to take a st- huge step forward. Zach Pickens, I've been very pleased with the summer that Zach has had. You look at the, that's four quality big bodies inside, and I, I talked about the two young freshmen uh, earlier. Uh, Alex Huntley and, and Micaiah Scott certainly fit in. Uh, both guys extremely bright and learn well. So it's, it's, I, I feel very good about that position. Let's go back to David Kloniger. Well, uh, you also lost a lot on special teams. I mean, you do have Parker coming back at kicker. But who do you look at right now to punt and hold, long snap, all those positions? Well, we're still working through. Uh, Kai Kroger is extremely talented at the punter position. Uh, a guy that's got a, a really good leg. He's also a left-handed punter, which puts a different rotation on the ball, which is more difficult to catch. Uh, but but he is extremely talented. I think Parker feels most comfortable with Kai holding at this time. But Trey Atkins is held. Luke Doty is held. I mean, we, we're, we're trying to work some different guys uh, in there, but it's going to come down to whoever Parker feels most comfortable with. Mitch Jeter is a really talented guy. Uh, you know, as far as kicking is concerned, uh, you know, obviously Parker will be our place kicker, but Mitch is a guy that I feel comfortable about kicking off. We, we still need to work through some of the things there as far as that's concerned because we had then obviously not done that live yet and not looked at that as far as those things are coming, but he's got a really strong leg. Uh, so, you know, I, I feel very comfortable about our talent level at the position. Obviously, there's some inexperience, and you lose a guy like Joe, who, who's doing a great job for the Panthers now from what I understand or, or what he texts me, which he'll, he'll text me that he's the best kicker in the country every, every time. So I, I don't know if I can truly trust, trust what he says. But uh, those guys are really talented. But I think, again, from, a, from an ability standpoint, we've got some guys that, that, that can be really good. Matt Bailey will be our snapper uh, today. Uh, Nick Muse would probably be his backup. Nick was he snapped at William and Mary and also in high school. Uh, and he's a talented guy as well that can snap. And you've got, you know, obviously going through the time we're going through, you better have dependable backups in all these situations. And, uh, you know, as far as kick returns, I don't really know. You know, I know as far as, you know, the, the punt return, you know, situation, Jamie Robinson's been a guy that's been very dependable. Uh, J.C. Horn's been a guy that's gone back. Xavier Leggett, uh, Shy Smith, uh, some guys that I think athletically can do some good things for us. Let's go back to Ben Briner from the state. Ben? Uh, Will, has, has Jamar Brown been able to, to maintain the weight he added uh, before last season? And, and where do you see him as potentially a, a guy that can help this year? Well, we're, we've moved Jamar to safety. Uh, he's a guy that uh, I really, you know, d- done some nice things on the back end. He's got a really good feel uh, on the back end. He's extremely bright, so he learns well. And then, and then looking at him as a dime linebacker, so you really, in essence, have six DBs on the field. It gives us some more flexibility to call the game and be able to cover down in disguise better. Uh, when he's in the game from a coverage standpoint. So, you know, I wouldn't say we've completely moved him, but he's still going to play dime linebacker for us in safety. John Whittle with the next question. Uh, with DJ Warner being gone, you obviously got a new buck this year. I know Brad Johnson was injured a lot last year. What have you seen out of, out of him this summer? Do you think he can kind of take that next step and elevate his game to, to where you see mm-hmm. that position? And, also, how do you feel about the backups at that spot? Well, you know, J.J. can play the buck for us too, John. We might be a little bit more four down than we've been three down, uh, uh, you know, just because of personnel. That that's will we'll evolve a little bit as that goes and how that looks in camp. But J.J. can play the buck. He's very athletic. Brad's a guy that is going to play both Sam and Buck for us. Uh, so when we do play more regular teams, you know, we're going to face some more depending on who our other two opponents, but we're going to face more what I would call regular personnel, you know, two backs, tight end or two tight ends, one back, a more regular personnel uh, personnel to match group. Uh, so we've, we've looked at, uh, you know, Brad as a Sam linebacker as well. Uh, but, you know, Jordan Birch and Gilbert Edmond, uh, Rodriguez Fenton, uh, all of those guys have, 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 you know, we'll see see how they pan out through camp. I've been pleased so far. But I, I, Brad, I've got all the confidence in the world in Brad. Brad's a really good rusher. 
uh, can do some really good things for us. And, you know, moving J.J. over that, there will help a little bit. And you got, you know, at the end, you got Aaron Sterling back, who's been an extremely productive player for us in his first three years. Uh, and, you know, Joe Anderson, Tonka Hemingway, Tyreek Johnson. I mean, all of those guys have come along and done some nice things at times, you know, for us as far as those things. Let's go back to Colin Taylor. Well, how much – in terms of just offensive installation, where would you say you're, you are with that? and um, How much can you kind of glean from these OTA-style workouts where you're not getting maybe the full practice time that you would be this sure. year? Sure. Uh, well, I, I think, you know, we're about 80 85% offensively as far as the installation. And I think more than anything, the base concepts have been installed. And then from there, you know, even on defense, you know, base staple things that we've installed and then kind of, you know, your, 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 you know, change ups on third down, uh, some of your specialty situations, one minute, uh, some of those calls we've been over. I wouldn't necessarily say that they were installed, uh, but we are further along than we normally would be because of the, the, the OT days. I think as much as any column, what you learn is, you know, how guys take it from the classroom to the field, especially young players if you've never been with them before. And, you know, Joe Cox is new, Coach Bobo's new, Des Kitchens is new. So they're, they're you know, teaching a, some uh, concept in the classroom, and then we're going to the field, and they're learning what that player can handle. And so I think you can learn a lot from that standpoint, um, and, and we got to continue to move forward. Gene Sapikoff with the next question. About your running back room relative to what you've had the last couple seasons at that position. Well, we lost some some really good players there. Obviously, Rico, Tavian, Feaster, Mon Denson did a nice job for us. Um, but again, I like the ability level in the position. Uh, interested to get the Quandre on the field. Um, I don't know exactly what day Clint said he would be back, but I'm interested to get him on the field. Uh, Adam Prentice has been a really good addition. Number one, he knows the offense. Number two to be able to create some more two-back, which is not something you see a whole lot of, and I think that's going to help us. But, uh, you know, Marshawn's extremely talented, been very pleased in the, in the time that we spent with Rashad Amos, and then Kevin and Deshaun have done some nice things. So, uh, again, I want to, you know, before we start, you know, promoting anything, we need, to, we need to put some pads on at that position and see how those guys run through contact and if they can make a guy miss uh, on the second level and if they can score. So, I mean, that's, that's going to be a huge, you know, evaluation for those guys as we move forward. But as far as the mental aptitude and as far as the work ethic and all those things, I've been very pleased. Let's go to Mitch Brown. Hey, well, obviously uh, you've been through turnover before, but you talked about all the new aspects uh, from on the coaching staff, obviously with the new recruiting class in as well. Uh, I'm wondering with everything being mostly virtual now and obviously having these small groups, what the, I guess, adjustment has been like trying to get everybody kind of caught up to what you guys do here at South Carolina this summer as opposed to maybe uh, another summer where you could have things more physical. Well, it is different, but it's the new normal. And unfortunately, I think we might be doing it for a while. Um, I'll probably tell you that I'm the probably the ones that struggle with it the most. I can't turn on a computer unless Joe Lyle does it for me or, or George Wynn. So it's been a struggle for me probably more than the players. The players are much more adaptable to these situations than, than the coaches are. But they've handled it well. Uh, we have because of the size of the long facility. We, we're able to get in some of the meeting rooms and social distance in the meeting room and being able to get eyeball to eyeball and teach and coach and take it from the classroom to the field. So, Mitch, you know, since we, we, we've been able to meet with them starting on July 13th, you know, we've been able to do that uh, in the meeting room because of the size of our buildings, which is obviously we appreciate that, and I, and I know our players do as well. But we've also done – when we do meet as a team, we're able to meet in the indoor facility, social distance in there. We've got a big screen in there that we're able to, to go through. So there's a lot of adjustments. And, and uh, you know, again, Clint Haggard and George Wynn kind of set up all the parameters of how we meet and the social distancing that's got to take place within the meeting uh, in those situations. But, again, I think our guys have handled it well. Go to Mike Uba. Oh, well, I know you mentioned the limited um, meetings, and limited uh, number of people in these meetings. I know some of the NFL teams have talked about, you know, potentially not having a quarterback or two in meetings and being able to separate them. So just in case if a player gets it, it won't affect all the players. Uh, have you had any discussions like that, whether it's in the quarterback room or at any other position? Well, we are social distance in all meetings. 
So there shouldn't be any contact tracing if we're doing what we're supposed to do in the meetings. And uh, I know Clint and George check most all the meetings. I usually stick my head into most meetings and check to make sure we're doing what we're supposed to do and following the proper protocol. And if we do that, we shouldn't have any issues as far as that's concerned. But we have, you know, put different guys at that position in different lifting groups to make sure that there isn't a contact trace that they can go back and, and look on that, we, that may, may have occurred in the weight room or something like that. But we're using the game day locker room for most of our underclassmen. We're trawling them over like we used to uh, so we can social distance in the locker room. And then we're using the long facility for most of the upperclassmen so we social distance in the locker room. And we've got some protocols within the shower heads and, and, um, and bathroom and things like that. Entire season. Yes. Yeah. Josh Kendall with the next question. Well, you mentioned the potential importance of depth this year. Have, will you structure your practices any differently to be prepared for an eventuality where you've got some guys who might have not taken a practice snap who have to play? Well, again, I, you know, based on the, you know, listening to Clint and talk in terms of how we practice, as long as we've got face covering. Uh, we should be fine, which we will, uh, as far as practice is concerned. But I think in all situations, we are preparing as a staff, uh, you know, uh, where we, based on what I'm hearing from the Southeastern Conference, I think we'll be tested three times a week, Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday, uh, to ensure uh, the, the safest uh, situation on game day for our student athletes and the opposing student athletes that we're playing. Uh, but, you know, again, I think that we've all got to keep in mind you know, being able to move people around that can go and be a productive player if, if you are in a situation where you lose a student athlete at a position. Is there a certain number that you feel like if, if we had an outbreak and we lose 12 guys or 18 guys, it's not tenable? Or does there become a situation where you would, it becomes a safety issue if, for instance, you're playing – you have to play walk-ons on the offensive or defensive line. How far down that road have you gone mentally? Well, we've had a lot of discussions uh, as far as as a league, uh, and I think a little of that was the decision uh, was to stay, you know, a league-only schedule to make sure that we could all work together because we have one commissioner that's going to end up making the decision at the end. We did have one discussion about that, and, and, and in my mind, you know, I said 30 from a standpoint. If you have 85 scholarship guys – and obviously, depending on position and quarterback and centers are two major issues you could have. Uh, but if you, you're down to 55, well, that's, you know, we're 45 active on game day in the National Football League and 53 travel on the roster. So you're taking yourself down to a 55-man roster, which, which should be doable. Anything more than that, I don't think could be doable. Let's go to Pete Acabelli. First of all, when will will Ernest be back for the start of practice? Oh yeah, yeah, he'll be back. Yeah. And um, do you? I mean, you know what it's like to prepare a team properly for games in a season. Is there any concern that practice won't look like practice, and some things will be compromised because of what you guys are going to have to go through? No, I think Pete. That's what I said earlier. We need to be smart about how we practice, and we need to do a great job of monitoring our catapult system. I'm going to really lean on Clint and Paul Jackson during this time as far as, you know, how they feel like the guys are doing. We, we, we monitor total yardage, which is a huge indicator for us on, you know, how much a guy's been on his legs and then how many, uh, what they would say above 12 miles an hour is what they consider a hard effort. And how many of those are we registering in a practice? So we monitor all this daily to make sure that we're not making mistakes and we're not over – uh, you know, using the athlete, we need to be realistic that some guys are not in the same shape as others as far as their conditioning is concerned. Uh, so we just need to be smart as far as those things are concerned. I haven't made a practice schedule for the first time in my coaching career uh, in August because I'm obviously we had to wait on the schedule, number one. Uh, but number two, I'm going to see how we go through next week, and I'm going to sit down with Paul and, and talk in terms of our conditioning by player to, to, to see what he thinks as far as those things are concerned. I mean, contact is necessary for preseason practice and for getting ready for games. There's, there's nothing you can do about the, the kind of scrums that you get on the field right. because of that, is there? I mean, again, I think that, you know, you got to be contact ready for September 26th, and, um, and, and we will be. 
Scott Eisberg has the next question. Scott. Uh, hey, well, just uh, wondering, I mean, obviously some states are playing high school football, others are not. Uh, how is recruiting working? I mean, I, I, could you bring, are you going to be able to bring any guys on campus? Or you, you can't go out and see some players from some states, others you can. I mean, how is recruiting working during this entire pandemic and keeping the wheel rolling of your program? Well, it's difficult. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's been tough. Uh, we are dead through the end of August. I don't know what it's going to look like moving forward in the fall. We're still waiting to hear on that. Uh, and whatever guidance we have from there, we've got some plans as far as those things are concerned. You know, what official visits will be look like, when they will be able to happen. I don't have any answers to those questions right now. Uh, so we'll continue to, to work through that and try and anticipate as best we can of what could and might happen. Uh, it's been frustrating. A lot of kids are, uh, you know, frustrated from the standpoint of not being able to come on campus, not being able to see. Uh, some kids are making decisions and creating reservations more than commitments, in my opinion. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what happens as we continue to move forward. But I don't have a lot of answers right now. Phil Cornblue. Will, over the summer, and even here recently, we've seen where, like, Davo Sweeney and Gary Patterson and Steve Adazio and coach at Washington State all being called out by players for one thing or another publicly. So are you guys in the college coaching profession facing a new dynamic in dealing with your players moving forward because of maybe the players now feeling more empowered with social media and social movements and things like that? Well, again, I think that uh, I don't know that things have changed. I don't, I don't really feel like that. I think, I think, I don't think, I don't think players have changed. Uh, I think that maybe the times have changed a little bit as far as how we communicate. Uh, and, uh, and I've always tried to, to be upfront and transparent with our guys as far as where things are. Uh, if I'm, you know, I always tell the players all the time, if I'm upset about something that you've done or said or, or, or what's happened, I'm going to address it eyeball to eyeball, man to man. Uh, and that's, that's how I was brought up. And that's how I like to deal with people. And if there's an issue or a problem, let's, let's get it handled. Uh, and that's what I encourage our guys to do. Uh, but I think as, as much open form as you can for your players so they have a voice and they understand that their voice is valued within your organization is really important. But that's the way we've always been. And uh, when I make a mistake, I admit, hey, I made a mistake. Uh, when something doesn't go right or it doesn't follow through the way that I wanted it to, I stand in front of the team and say it was on me. It didn't, it didn't happen the way we wanted it to happen. And, uh, and that's the way we try and deal with things. But I don't, uh, I don't think players have changed at all. I think maybe our, the times have changed a little bit. And, and because of the different media opportunities you have to communicate, has, have allowed that to happen. The way we communicate is, is not what it used to be. And, and that's just the way I was raised. You dealt with things eyeball to eyeball, not putting it out on Twitter. But that's, that has changed a little bit, and that's, it's, that's frustrating for a guy like me to deal with at times. But that's where we are, and, and you got to understand that point. But you can't always look at things through a misopic view of how it affects me. You know, you've got to be able to step in somebody else's shoes and say, I wonder how they see this. I wonder how they see the circumstance. And I think a lot of times, especially in my position, when you're able to ask a player to step out of his shoes and see it from my, my point of view, then they, they normally look at me and go, okay, coach, I understand what you're saying now. I understand what you, what you see and what you thought and what you saw. Uh, but, again, we, we try and be as transparent as we can. And if I can follow up, have you discussed with your senior leadership the new NCAA rule that will allow – for social messaging on the uniforms mm -hmm. and how you might deal with some no, conflict we, that might arise. No, we haven't we haven't talked about that yet. I think that'll be go through a uh, the student advisory camp on campus uh, here in the athletic department is based on what Chance Miller and Ray both told me, and then we'll discuss with our players as we move forward. Ben Briner, Ben Briner is the next question. Uh, hey, Will. Uh, at some point this offseason, you mentioned Jovan Gwen potentially working in it at center. Does, mm -hmm. Is that still in the cards or with 
Jordan uh, opting out, does that kind of get shelved for the short term? No, we, we rep, you know, just in pre-practice as far as snaps are concerned. Obviously, Hank and Eric, uh, but you're going to see Vershawn Lee. You're going to see Javon Gwynn. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a bad day when you, when you run out of a center. Uh, as far as snaps are concerned and, and those things. But Javon will continue to play there. Vinny Murphy uh, as well as playing guard. Uh, so all those guys will rep in there at the center. So they'll, they'll snap with all, uh, all four quarterbacks uh, every day. Colin Taylor is the next question. Yeah, well, Ray Tanner's kind of talked about telling programs to kind of restructure their budget, try to save as much money as possible. I'm curious from the football side of things, how have you guys gone about maybe trying to – tighten the, you know, the belt a little bit in terms of monthly, and is there any way that you've kind of done that right now? Uh, you need to ask George Wynn, Chance Miller, or Ray Tanner that. I don't deal with budgets. David Kloniger has the next question. Well, uh, how do you guys social distance when you're in your individual position, meeting rooms, and especially when you have a position like center or quarterback, how vital is the social distance in those meeting rooms? Well, we're using for the offensive line and defensive lines, we're meeting in the indoor. And, and so we've got a big screen there. We, we uh, structure our lift times where one group will be in the weight room, one group will be in the indoor meeting. Uh, we utilize our big team meeting room for our receivers, the bigger, you know, some of the bigger groups, the defensive meeting room for our defensive backs, the bigger group. We're using our staff meeting for the linebackers. Uh, the quarterbacks are able to meet in the in, in the quarterback room because it's an, it's it's by uh, by law social distance is, is there. So all meeting rooms have been approved. We've got name tags on all the all the chairs where the guys know where they're supposed to be sitting uh, in the rooms to make sure we're social distancing, keeping a mask on. Uh, you know, continue to talk to our guys about washing their hands and and all that all all that stuff. Eric Boynton. Coach, I didn't know if you, you were aware there was an online petition that sprung up uh, over the weekend uh, to save the South Carolina and Clemson game. It's being directed to Greg Sankey and various uh, state politicians. It claims to have signatures from both you and uh, Davo Sweeney. Are you aware of it? Did you sign it, or is that an imposter that signed it, maybe using your name? It was an imposter. Hey, I want to play the game. That was a league decision, and we're all disappointed. Everybody in the state, everybody at our institution, and I'm sure theirs. So it's, it's frustrating, but this is the situation that we're in. John Whittle. What, what have you heard about Paul Jackson over, over the course of the summer, and, and how, how do you feel like he has impacted the program uh, since, since his arrival going through the summer session into August? I think Paul and his entire staff have done a really good job. You know, it's been a really a grind on them because, you know, John, going back to June, because we were in, I guess, phase one coming back in the weight room, we had to spread our groups out. And we only could uh, – thank goodness we've got a huge 20,000-foot – a, a square foot weight room, but we had to spread out our group. So they were starting at seven in the morning and they're walking out of here at five thirty, six, seven o'clock at night. And it was about a 12 hour day for them, uh, four days a week on a four day lift, lift plan, which is what we're on now. So, but I think they've done a really good job. I think that, you know, to keep up, to see the last since July 13th, from my standpoint as a coach, when we're able to work with our players a little bit more to see the enthusiasm that our guys have in the weight room, uh, through the walkthroughs, uh, that says a lot about his group because they're keeping that that enthusiasm going. Uh, and I didn't see a bunch of guys that felt tired or didn't, you know, were, were not excited about being in the building. And I, and that's what I saw. And I think you attribute that to your strength staff. And Paul's done a fantastic job of that. He's pretty active on Instagram too, posting some workout videos of, of the guys and, and, and of other things. Do you, do you like that? Yeah, that's that's great. He works out every day, too. Does he put any Instagrams on him? <laughs> I don't know if he's done that or not. He wears all them tight shirts. He, he gets some mediums. Mike Uva has the next question. Coach, uh, how will uh, traveling be maybe a little different this year? Have you guys discussed maybe sending less people, taking more mm -hmm. buses, and if you have to you know, take a plane, how will that look? Well, I told our guys when we started, I said, you know, the travel limit's at 70. It might be at 50 this year. So you better figure it out. We're not going to be traveling the orange eaters and steak, steak eaters. So understand that part. you got to be contributing and playing if you're going to travel. 
Uh, I told Coach Tanner uh, back in, I guess it was May, I was thinking about traveling as far as those things. If our league would bump back all the games from 3.30 or later, travel the day of the game, fly in four hours before the game, go eat you a pregame meal, and go to the ballpark. When I was at Valdosta State and worked for Chris Hatcher, we did that. We were undefeated. You know, we got fancy and flew to Delta State in the first round of the playoffs and got our ass kicked that, that next day. We got fancy and we stayed in the hotel the night before the game. We thought we were big time and we got out there and got waxed. So now they, they watered down the field and Steve Campbell's the head coach of South Alabama before the game. But, uh, but we got waxed because we got fancy. So I told our guys, we might just be traveling just like you did in Little League. You got your, your helmet and your, your shoulder pads. And we're going to fly a day at a game. You, you pick your stuff up and you walk into Paul Park in your cleats and let's go play. So that's what we got to do. That's what we'll do. Have you had input at all in terms of saying, hey, maybe we should play earlier games that the coaches in the SEC discuss that? No, those decisions aren't going to be made by coaches. They may ask our opinion, but they ain't going to do what we tell them. I've learned that in this league. Ben Briner is the next question. Ben. Uh, well, since he's been on campus, just what kind of an impact have you seen from Joe Cox, both on this receiver group and kind of on the recruiting trail? Well, I think Joe, number one, is a really bright guy. He, uh, he's got a really good work ethic. Um, he understands, you know, you always like to have somebody in the room that kind of understands what you want done offensively, defensively, special teams, whatever case may be. And he's got a great understanding of what we're doing offensively. Uh, and uh, the guy's a tireless recruiter. He relates with players extremely well. He's also a guy that can coach guys hard. Uh, so I've been, I've been very pleased with Joe. Uh, now I know why Mike was so high on him coming here, and, uh, and uh, I'm glad we made that decision. I'm glad things have worked out this way. John Whittle with the next question. Well, this is the last thing for me, and I apologize if, if you addressed this earlier and I missed it, but do you have any staff members within the program who have decided to – to, to stay out for a little while due to health concerns or anything no. of that nature? No, I, I'm not letting Clyde Wren in the building. Clyde's an older fellow, and he's mad at me. He won't talk to me. I've been trying to call him, and he, he won't answer my calls. So I don't know. i got to deal with that. But, no, he, he's been great. i just I just, you know, concerned about his, his age right now, and I've asked him to stay out of the building. But other than that, everybody's been fine. Thanks. I don't see any other hands raised, so – and one last call for questions. Dick, Dick Cox. All right, Dick, you have to unmute yourself. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, I was going to find out. Uh, two years ago, Debo stepped up and had a great year for you, elite player, SEC. Last year, Brian Edwards stepped up. Do you feel like Shia Smith is ready to be one of the elite players in the SEC this year? Sure. I think, you know, Shia, you know, you look at the receiver position in, in who we play. You know, the number one thing is you got to beat press coverage, and Shaq can win versus press coverage. And uh, he's a guy that's got big, big time top end speed. And I think you go back to, I told Shaq the other day, you know, your freshman year was, was something that we were expecting more to continue to come. And now is your opportunity as a senior uh, to end it the right way. And I certainly believe he can be an elite receiver in our league. Also, you had a birthday this week. Congratulations. Happy birthday. Were you able to go out and do anything special on your birthday? I went out to Hickory Tavern with my son, Witt. Carol's at the beach and Jackson's in Athens. So it was just me and Witt. We had a heck of a time. Did you go back and watch film afterwards? Yep. All right, cool. Anything else for Coach? We all good? All right, appreciate everybody jumping on. Stay all right, safe. All guys, thank you all. Look forward to seeing you all in the fall.